Our reading from God's Word this morning comes from Philippians chapter 4, and we will be completing our study of Philippians this morning. I'll be reading from chapter 4, verses 10 through 23. The theme of joy and rejoicing is a major theme in Paul's letter to the Philippians, and as we read this, uh, you, can, you can hear it yet again in Paul's, uh, in Paul's words. So let's listen together to the Word of God. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, now that at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, And I know how to abound. In in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Thus ends Paul's letter to the to the Philippians. Well, last week I asked you about your rejoice meter. That little uh, imaginary meter that measures the extent to which you are experiencing and expressing the joy of Jesus Christ in your life. How did it go this week? Anyone want to volunteer? How did the, did any improvement on your rejoice meter? Did you move maybe from a two to a, a four or a seven? How did, how did the rejoice meter go? Uh, personally, I was out mulching this week. My rejoice meter was bumping up around one. And my wife said, Well, you know, it is a nice day. And at least you're healthy enough to do this. And so I found myself preaching to myself, thinking, okay, Chris, make the choice to rejoice. And though I didn't start singing hymns or jumping up and down or anything, uh, I had the opportunity to make the choice to rejoice. So how about you? How did your rejoice a meter respond this week? Pointed out last week that there are several things that keep are rejoicing down. Again, rejoicing ought to be our natural condition. When you think of who God is and all that He's done for us, it ought to be natural for us. It ought to be spontaneous for us to be rejoicing. But there are things that kind of suppress and hold back our rejoicing. For example, as just mentioned, we don't make the choice to rejoice. That inhibits our rejoicing and joy, and often we do not experience the peace of Christ because we haven't prayed through to peace, and we don't experience that peace and consequently not the joy. And also Paul pointed out that experiencing the peace of Christ and the joy that flows from it comes when we don't pay attention to our thinking, when we don't manage our minds, when we don't demonstrate our thinking. Paul was a man of joy. Now, we can see in our text this morning yet another obstacle to joy, something that Paul learned to do that resulted in joy. 
Did you pick up what it was? Paul says that in every all circumstances, he had learned to be content. Learn to be content. And brothers and sisters, if you are not feeling joy, if you are not rejoicing, one of the inhibitors, one of the things that may be suppressing your joy, quenching your joy, may be your discontent. And so if we had a discontentometer, how would yours be reading today? Are you content or are right now, are you experiencing thoughts, feelings, of discontent. If you're not rejoicing, if you're not experiencing the joy of Christ, it may be that you are experiencing discontent. And so the question for us this morning is to look at Paul's words and to see how Paul, this man of joy, can teach us how to learn content. And again, underline the word learn, that's the phrase Paul uses, he says he learned the secret, he learned to be content. It wasn't automatic. He didn't start with contentment. It was a process. And so there's hope for you and for me. If we're not experiencing contentment, then it's something that we can learn, we can develop. And so let's look at Paul's words in this section so that we can learn to be content, and consequently, we can learn to experience more freely the joy and the rejoicing that we have in Jesus Christ. Contentment. Now, needless to say, contentment is a rare commodity in our world today. Can I hear an amen? It's a rare commodity. I mean, for one thing, contentment is not our nature. Part of our uh, the, one of the results of our broken nature, living in a broken world, is that as human beings, by nature, we're not content. We'd always like to have a little bit more than we have. We'd like to be a little better than we are. We would like our situation to be more improved, bigger, better, cleaner. Our nature is, we're, we're not content by nature. And we're also... Contentment is rare because our culture is a consumer culture, and part of a consumer culture is that we are awash in advertising, and the way advertising works is to highlight and stoke our discontent, they call it creative discontent in advertising, to stoke our discontent, to make us unhappy with our breath or unhappy with the ring around our collar or make us unhappy with those horrid age spots that appear on our hands, to stoke our discontent so that we will buy their product, which they claim will solve our problems, make us better, improve us, make us happier, and make us content. So in a consumer culture like ours, awash in advertising, our discontent is fueled and stoked and encouraged so that we'll buy stuff. And social media doesn't help. Social media has put us in contact with more and more people, people who are uh, displaying themselves and inviting comparisons. And so we're on social media and we see other people who look better than we look, who have nicer vacations than we have, that have nicer stuff and better stuff, people who seem to be more content and more fulfilled, and we see this constantly in social media, and again, it encourages these feelings of, of discontent, that what we have is not enough and who we are is not enough. And so... Discontent's a rare commodity. Not only that, that in our culture, dis or contentment is seen as a vice, not a virtue. The thought is, well, if you're content, you don't change. If you're content, you don't move ahead. I mean, we couldn't have put men on the moon if people had been content. It was that restlessness, that discontent that drove that development. And so if we want progress, we need the discontentment of the young and the restless. And so don't be content, but rather be discontent with your status quo and move ahead and move on. And so in so many words, we're taught that discontent is a vice. It hurts us. It doesn't really 
help us. Well, how can you and I learn to be like Paul, to be people of joy by swimming upstream against these powerful currents of discontent that's in the air that we breathe? How do we learn this contentment? Well, first of all, three things that learning contentment does not mean. Does not mean. First of all, we don't learn contentment by denial. By looking at bad things and saying that really they're good things. We don't learn contentment with our situation by thinking that our bad situation really is a good situation. Again, you look at the Apostle Paul and he makes a distinction between plenty and want. And he doesn't say that want is a good thing. He doesn't deny want. He's in prison. He doesn't deny that being in prison is a bad thing. He's dealing with people who are preaching Christ for false motives. He never says that, well, that's really a good thing. He's got people who are happy that he's in prison. And he never says that that's a good thing. Yet in spite of all of that stuff, Paul is content. So his contentment did not come from a kind of denial that we often practice by looking at a bad situation and trying to convince ourselves that it's really a good thing. I hear this when it comes to death. People say, well, Sarah was so sick that death was her friend. Now, I get that. I, I understand that. But brothers and sisters, death is never our friend. Death is always the enemy. Death is always the enemy. And we are invited to not grieve as others grieve, not because death is not a bad thing, that death is an interference in the work that God originally created. We don't get there by denial. So in the same way, when we, in the situations that you're in right now, bad situations, hurtful situations, you learn contentment not by somehow convincing yourself that the bad stuff you're going through is really good. Secondly, we don't learn contentment by being silent. And again, we often think that we shouldn't talk about our difficulties because that demonstrates lack of contentment. Or we shouldn't express our problems to others because that's not really contentment. Well, again, Paul was a man of joy. He was a man who learned contentment, but listen to the letter. He... He's quite free to talk about his difficulties, that he was uh, suffering from want rather than plenty, that he was being misunderstood by these other preachers, preaching for the wrong reasons. Paul expresses his difficulties. He's not silent. And so in the same way, learning to be content doesn't mean shutting up and not sharing the difficulties, the hardships, the suffering that you may be experiencing. We don't, in some sense, uh, uh, undermine contentment by speaking of our difficulties. So learning to be content doesn't mean learning to be silent and shut up about the things that you're going through. And thirdly, that Learning contentment doesn't come from resignation, complacency. Again, you look at Paul, the man of joy, the man of contentment. He was not resigned to his situation. He may have been in prison, but he wanted to get out of prison. He may have been suffering want, but he took joy in receiving things from these churches. Contentment didn't just come from, well, K Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be what it will be. He was not passive. He wasn't resigned. I read an article years and years ago about prayer called Prayer, Rebellion Against the Status Quo. You and I wouldn't pray if we resigned ourselves to our circumstances. But we pray because we're in a circumstance. It seems to be bad. 
we want help, and so we ask God for help. We don't just resign ourselves. And so learning contentment does not mean that you look at the situations that you're in this morning, the bad stuff that's going on, and just shake your head and say, well, whatever. Contentment doesn't mean resignation. So we live in a broken world. We're broken people. And learning to be content doesn't mean denial. It doesn't mean keeping your mouth shut. And learning to be content doesn't mean resignation. Well, how do we learn content, contentment? Well, I think if you look at this entire section, what Paul says about contentment, it could be summarized in this statement. This is a great statement. I ran across it this week. Contentment does not depend on what we have, but on who we have within and on what we have in him. Listen to that again. Contentment does not depend on what we have, but on who we have within and what we have in him. Now let's take that apart, that phrase. I think there are three parts. First of all, contentment does not depend on what we have. It does not depend on what we have. Paul said, for I have learned in whatever situation, whatever situation I'm in, to be content. Richer, poorer, better, worse, whatever situation he was in, he was content. It didn't depend on his circumstances. So contentment doesn't come from what we possess. It doesn't come from getting what we want. Again, I did a little Google search this week and ran across an article in Psychology Today by a secular psychologist who was trying to come up with a definition of contentment, and that's the best he could do. He said, the best I can do is contentment is getting what you want. (laughs) Some of you have gotten what you've wanted, and you know it doesn't necessarily lead to contentment. So contentment isn't getting what we want. We don't get contentment when our sickness turns to health or when our poverty turns to wealth. When we go from being unemployed to being employed doesn't come from graduating, doesn't come from getting your driver's license, doesn't come from becoming more attractive or having bigger muscles or getting a great job or being included in that group of people, or doesn't come from retirement. Some of you are currently in this situation. Many of you have been. Boy, I'll be content when I get my driver's license. I don't have to depend on my parents driving me everywhere. If I get my driver's license, I'll be content. Now, for those who've had your driver's license, did that work? Or, you know, if I can just get through high school, if I can just get through, pass, keep my father off my back, I'll be content. Well, that happens, and there isn't really much contentment. Well, if I could just get into a good school, then I'd be content. If I could just find somebody that loves me, uh, then I'll be content. If I could could just make a little bit more money than I'm making, then I'd be content. If I could find a wife or a husband, then I'd be content. If I could have kids, then I would be content. If I could just retire, (laughs) then I'd be content content. The more experience you have in life, the more you realize that Paul's words are absolutely true, that contentment does not depend on what we have. Second phrase, contentment does not depend on what we have, but on who we have within. Contentment does not depend on what we have, but who we have within. Listen to Paul's words. I can do all things through him 
who strengthens me. Paul here is acknowledging that amazing reality that the Son of God, through his Holy Spirit, lives in him. All stop. I don't think we think about that reality nearly enough. That as a believer, as a follower of Christ, you have within you the Son of God through His Holy Spirit. Not up there, out there, in you. Right now, in you. Not just a little piece, not just a little taste. You have the Son of God through the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. The one through whom all things were created, living in you. The one who right now is sustaining the universe, living in you. The one who loves you more than you know, living in you. The one for whom nothing is impossible... Nothing is impossible living in you. Christ, the wisdom of God and the power of God, the love of God dwelling in you. Contentment does not depend on what we have, but on who we have within. Now, I think if you really take that seriously, if you meditate on that reality, I think you will find your discontent beginning to diminish, beginning to fade. We have the Son of God through His Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So the first part... Contentment does not depend on what we have, but on who we have within, and thirdly, what we have in Him. What we have in Him. What do we have in Him? Again, Paul says, I can do this through Christ who strengthens me. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What do you have within when Christ is there? Well, I suggest three things. It's always three things. My sermons are very Trinitarian. We've already mentioned his presence, but his power, his power, his strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means that you have the strength right now, today, in your current circumstances, you have the strength to do anything that God calls you to do. Anything God calls you to do right now, you have the strength to do it. You have the strength to endure any hardship right now. You right now have the strength to endure any sickness, any difficulty. You have that strength within you. Again, in Paul's case, he had the strength to get him through prison. He had the strength to deal with those who opposed him. No matter what your situation is this morning, no matter how bad or bleak or hopeless it may seem, You have God's power, His strength, in you, right now. You don't need any more. You have all the strength and power that you need right now. What else do we have in Christ? Well, we have His provision. Again, He said, my God, verse 19, my God will supply Every need of yours, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. All that Jesus has 
is available to you. And everything that is belongs to Jesus. As the psalmist said, the the cattle on a thousand hills, it belongs to him. All that money that you think you need, it belongs to him. All that sense of value and purpose that you think you need, it belongs to him. All the wonderful houses that you wish you could live in, they all belong to him. That marvelous vacation spot that you just can't afford, but the people next door can, it all belongs to him. Health, it all belongs to him. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. As a believer, you have Jesus' presence within, and with his presence comes his power, with his presence comes his provision. It's all there. The third thing we have in Jesus is his promise. Again, verse 19, and my God will supply. My God will supply. God keeps his promises. He's infinitely faithful. God is not man that he should lie, it tells us, that, or that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Here we have a promise, a promise from the God who is always faithful, that he will supply every need of yours, every need of yours, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You have in Christ his power, you have his provision, and here you have his promise. Now, one of the implications of that promise is that right now, right now, in the circumstances that you're in right now, you already have for today everything you need. Think about that. If God says that my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus, that means that right now, today, at this moment, maybe not tomorrow or the next day, but right now, what you're experiencing right now, God is being faithful to this promise, and He right now is giving you everything you need, everything I need. Now, we might say, no, God, <laughs> I'm still, uh, I'm miserable, I'm hurting, I'm suffering. I Stop. Right now, at this moment, God is giving you not everything you may want or not everything you may think you need, but right now, because God is faithful to his promise, you are receiving everything you need from him. And it's for that reason that right here and now, no matter our circumstances, we can be thankful. We can be thankful. And sisters and brothers, that's contentment. That's contentment. It is learning the humble and thankful trust in God's presence, that humble and thankful trust in His power, that humble and thankful trust for his provision, and for his promise. Humble, thankful. Someone once said that gratitude makes everything you have enough. Gratitude makes everything you have enough. When we humbly trust God for who he is, trust him in all that he's done, trusting his power, trusting his provision when we rest, when we rest 
in those promises, when we give thanks for His promises, then we can be content. And when we're content, we can rejoice. When we, can, when we are content, we can rejoice. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we marvel at these promises. And we don't claim to understand them thoroughly. But we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power in us. We thank you for the riches and glory in Christ Jesus that you make available to us. And we thank you for your promise. Lord, we have every reason to be content. And we have every reason to rejoice. And so, God, we rejoice in you through Jesus and for his sake. Amen.